Welcome everyone uh, who's tuned in. So welcome to the first uh, analytical Gatan webinar of 2021. So I'm Liam Spillane. So I'm the analytical application scientist for Gatan based out of Pleasanton or San Francisco in California. And I'm super excited today to introduce our speaker, Berit Guj. So Berit is a PhD candidate in the School of Applied and Engineering Physics at Cornell University in Ithaca. So that's uh, based out of New York State here in the US. So Berit works with Professor Lena Korkutis, performing research in advanced analytical STEM. So Berit's work involves employing and using high resolution STEM and EELS techniques to study the exotic phases and phase transitions in atomically engineered oxide materials. And she's going to be presenting and sharing some of that work in today's webinar. So before we get started with the talk, I just want to cover a few housekeeping and admin pointers. So, okay, so it's basically how to submit questions. So if anyone has any questions throughout the webinar, the way to submit the questions is to just use the questions pane in the GoToWebinar kind of application. We'll deal with any questions regarding connectivity and kind of webinar performance immediately. But any questions that relate to the presentation content, we'll cover at the end kind of in a discussion uh, with Barrett. Uh, so that pretty much covers everything. And with that, I'll hand over to Barrett. So take it away, Barrett. Awesome. So uh, thanks so much, Liam. Um, and thank you to everyone else at Catan um, for the invitation to give this talk. It's really exciting to um, you know, be able to share really in depth some of the, the really cool EELS work that we're doing at Cornell and um, that we're, we're doing, um, trying to really like push the limits of what we can do with uh, quantitative and analytical STEM and EELS um, down to the atomic resolution. So um, you know, my talk title is an untimely joke, I guess, regarding the, the recent announcement out of Daft Punk, but um, it still, I think, kind of holds true that what we're really, you know, trying to do is um, reach these sort of harder, harder to reach phases of these um, atomic uh, quantum materials. And I'll, I'll talk about what makes them hard, but we want to study things that are cold or under other sort of in, in situ stimuli, um, cryogenics. Uh, strain, in-situ straining, in-situ biasing, things like that. Um, and so we want to reach these kind of harder to reach phase spaces, um, and we want to do it with better data quality. So we want to really push, you know, the signal to noise, the, the, the amount of information that we can extract from these measurements. And um, what that really also relies upon is our ability to do these experiments much, much faster. Um, again, relating to some of the challenges that come with these sort of in-situ conditions. And of course, um, you know, as someone who, who focuses really on atomic, atomically engineered materials, it's really important that, that we be able to do these at very, very small length scales. So we are always striving for, you know, atomic resolution is really what we need um, to explore some of these really interesting materials questions. Um, so uh, this, this EELS map that I'm showing um, here on the title slide is actually one um, that we just were able to acquire this fall using some of the new instruments um, that are uh, right at the tail end of being installed here at Cornell that I'll, I'll talk about at the end of the talk. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a 1000 by 1000 pixel EELS map running at um, about 500 microseconds per pixel. Um, and so the total, the total SI time for this for people who are familiar with atomic resolution, EELS is a very large field of view map, is actually um, just on the order of a few minutes um, with, with very small uh, a pixel size. And we're able to do this with a very high probe current. And so what this is you know, really pushing us towards are very high resolution but uh, measurements, but over very large length scales. So we want to push atomic resolution out to these kind of mesoscopic length scales so that we can start to explore um, some of the phase interactions and really exotic physics um, in these materials. So we're kind of trying to do everything all at once. Um, so just to kind of jump into the talk, then I want to just briefly introduce, I think most people um, are probably very familiar with uh, eels in general and, and of course the stem, so I won't bother um, introducing much of that. But I do, there are so many different kinds of eels that can be done. Um, and so I want to just kind of zero in and briefly introduce the type of eels that I am interested in and that this talk will really focus on. And so 
Um, I think, you know, for people in the sort of oxides or the materials community, perhaps one of the most sort of common forms of eels that you think of is elemental mapping. And so as most people know, we take the, the stem probe and we shoot it through a crystal and we collect the, um, the forward scattered electrons and, and disperse them in terms of energy. And that gives us, you know, something that looks like this, um, which we usually look at on its side. And this, of course, is an eel spectrum. And you'll see emerging from the, uh, the sort of sloping inelastic background, these characteristic peaks, um, which I think, again, most people know, can be related back to specific orbitals and specific bonding um, in specific elements. And so in this case, you can see the, the different elements in the sample that I've labeled here. And so what we're able to do um, using those edges one of the, the very common things that you'll see is elemental mapping. And of course, we can do this with atomic resolution. And so, um, again, for these really precisely engineered uh, materials that I study, um, understanding exactly the atomic structure of an interface, for instance, which we can we can study with this EELS map down here, is really, really important um, for the work that we do. And so um, this is, uh, again, something that I think a lot of people are familiar with, um, the use of EEL score, but it's worth pointing out that, um, especially with, you know, other instrumentation <laughs> improvements outside the sort of EEL spectrometer, for instance, with X-ray detectors and, and, and other microscope improvements, um, you know, EDX elemental mapping is approaching, um, you know, <laughs> basically the same levels, right? So we can now also atomically map elements with EDX. And in fact, um, the analysis for this kind of mapping is in many ways more straightforward than, than using eels for these same kind of, um, kind of experiments, right? But what eels can do that EDX can't is we can actually also access the chemical information um, of, of these atoms that we're looking at. And so here you can see plotted kind of a spectrum profile across the same interface on the left. And, and this is the oxygen K edge. And so the oxygen edge in these materials holds a lot of very rich, um, chemical and electronic information about the actual sort of states that are present in these materials. And so you can see as you go from the substrate down at the bottom um, of this, this profile up to the top into this, in this case, it's a thin film, there is a dramatic change in the shape of the oxygen K edge. And that really allows us to extract this kind of detailed chemical information that we're really, really interested in. And so the power of eels is really being able to marry this kind of chemical analysis with this kind of spatial resolution. And so um, because I you know, made such a big deal about it, I want to briefly, I'll just you know, kind of say, how do, we, how do we do chemical analysis on an eel spectrum? And so if we take a step back to the sort of think about the physics of the material for a moment, um, you, know, you have some atom in your sample, and that atom has um, electrons hanging out down in the core states. It has some electrons hanging out at sort of the outermost occupied states. And there are also then above you know, some energy, the Fermi level, there are also these unoccupied states. And so what happens? in the eels process is as the electron from the beam interacts with the electrons in our sample, we excite some of those core state electrons up into the unoccupied states. And so there's some characteristic energy transition or energy that's associated with that transition. So again, if we you know, sort of turn this schematic on its side, so it sort of looks like an eel spectrum, you can see how by looking at the intensity of the distribution of how these, um, these excitations occur, what we're basically mapping here is an eel's edge. And so this is sort of the zero order um, understanding of what the shape of an eel's edge tells you um, about the unoccupied states in the, the material that you're interested in. And so, um, you know, with that kind of theoretical example, I'm going to ground it a little bit just with a, a pretty recent um, concrete sort of experimental example. And so um, some people may know that uh, just over a year and a half ago, um, there was a, a new kind of superconductor discovered, um, these infinite layer nicolates. And so it's sort of the perovskite structure um, with these, the oxygens and the, the rare earth plane removed. And so um, you can see here that with the right doping, um, there's a superconduct, superconducting transition um, down around 15 Kelvin. And so what's kind of unique about these superconductors compared to other discoveries that have been made in the past is that they are, at this point, um, have only been produced in this very thin film geometry. And so these, these samples are only ever about um, 10 to, to 20 nanometers thick, and that's basically just 
um, related to this kind of growth parameters that are able to stabilize the structure. And so what that means is that eels and um, sort of really detailed fine structure analysis of the eels edges is really uniquely poised to be able to answer some really important um, questions about the electronic states in these materials compared to some other bulk probes um, that have been used more traditionally, but that have a hard time, you know, avoiding contributions from things like the substrate or, you know, sort of nanoscale inhomogeneities um, throughout the material. And so using uh, very localized eels in the stem, um, we were able to uh, study both, for instance, the oxygen K edge and by comparing the sort of parent perovskite um, state to the, the uh, infinite layer state, um, we, can, we can extract the, um, the electronic character and reveal that these materials are sort of unique from others and that they're actually um, Mott Hubbard materials, if, if people care what that is. Um, and we can also look at the nickel edge, which is particularly um, compelling with eels to be able to actually compare both edges at once, because now being able to study the two correlatively, we can actually show that there are some really intriguing sort of multi-band contributions apparently happening in those materials, again, um, unique to other superconductors in the past. So um, that's just a, a really quick overview. I'm not going <laughs> to go any deeper into the physics of this particular material system, um, but hopefully it shows you really what the power of this technique is. And of course, if you are interested in learning about the deep physics of this system, um, it's all written up and published, so you can um, obviously um, read that and reach out with any questions if you have any. Um, but for now, again, hopefully this is just a concrete example that this kind of technique is um, very powerful, especially for the materials and the, the physics communities. And so we're really trying to push it forward. Um, so, um, Right. The part of the problem is, is that even though we can do these kind of um, these local probes, if you look at the sort of relevant phase diagrams that we might be interested in, what you'll notice is that um, the temperatures are sort of intriguing. Right. And so we typically measure in, under ambient conditions at 300 Kelvin. But if you look at these phase diagrams in these 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 transport in the, for instance, in the, the superconducting case or even in the parent phase of these, these oxide materials that we're really interested in, you'll notice that the relevant temperatures are all below room temperature. So, um, of course, there's some transitions that happen a little bit below room temperature, maybe 200 Kelvin, um, but there's a lot of really interesting things like superconductivity in particular that in, in many materials happens much, much lower, um, even below liquid nitrogen. And so this is really what we're trying to do. Um, is we want to study these kinds of complex oxides and, and the core loss eels becomes really important for us. These quantum materials are, are what we're really interested in. Um, but in particular, not just their normal state, we really want to study the sort of in situ phase behavior of these materials. So how does that metal insulator transition progress? How does superconductivity onset in these materials? And so for that, we need to go beyond the kind of ambient conditions that we're used to studying um, with, with really high resolution stem and eels. Okay, so now to get into kind of the, the sort of technical and instrumentation aspects of that challenge, um, I, I um, so we'll just first introduce, you know, most people who do uh, cryo STEM or cryo TEM, um, things like that are probably familiar with a holder that looks something like this, right? And so um, if you want to reach these cryogenic states, the most uh, common way to do that is to use a liquid nitrogen holder. And I think um, the most common instruments that people use for these kind of analytical work are uh, primarily side entry instruments. Um, and so um, the holder looks like this. Um, of course, the doer sits outside the microscope. That's where you put the cryogen. Um, in this case, I'll be mostly talking about work with liquid nitrogen. Um, and then your sample sits out here at this, this thin tip that extends into the microscope. And so one thing that's inherent to all of these side entry cryo holders is that there's a big thermal gradient between the sort of cryogenically cooled sample, the, the cryo doer on the outside, and then the rest of the sort of warm microscope room, um, the microscope in the microscope room that exists. And so with this thermal gradient from very cold to much warmer, you can have um, a sort of perpetually changing thermal contraction and expansion um, of this long sample rod. And so what that does is it gives you very large um, or relatively large for these length scales um, drift at the, at the sample position while you're trying to measure. And so um, what does that look like? Well, if you take um, you know, a stem image of this interface, um, you can see now under liquid nitrogen cooling with this movie um, played back in real time, you can see how quickly that interface or, you know, just which is basically just a place marker drifts away from from where it started. And so you can imagine that if that's the sort of feature that you're interested in studying, 
it relatively quickly sort of moves away from the original position and the original field of view um, where you were interested. And in that last frame there, you just saw, um, you know, maybe a bubble in the cryogen or something uh, <laughs> even more, um, more disruptive. But this large scale thermal drift is what really sort of limits, um, especially slower acquisitions like eels. And we can actually quantify the, the amount of this drift by tracking the sample position um, over a long time. So in this case, it's just over four minutes. Um, and you can, we can extract, you can first of all see the, the very sort of directional nature of this drift. Again, that's the direction of the rod and the direction of thermal drift um, in this particular acquisition. And we can extract a sort of mean instantaneous velocity here, which is about um, three quarters of an angstrom per second. And so that's the kind of drift speed that we're up against um, under a lot of these sort of in situ cryogenic conditions. Now, for very fast imaging techniques or relatively fast imaging techniques, like um, in particular high resolution TEM or high resolution STEM, um, one way around this drift is actually to just acquire a series of very, very fast images, um, so like a, a stack of fast acquisitions, and then of course to sum them together um, to produce a, a high signal to noise average that has um, overcome those, those position differences um, as a function of drift. And so using these kind of techniques, there's been a lot of really successful cryo stem and cryo eels done already. And so, um, you know, using very high resolution stem, there's been some cool work mapping, um, you know, very with very high precision, the sort of subtle lattice distortions um, in these different quantum materials and different, different phases. Um, and then on the eels end of things, you can, you know, you can start to do things where you, for instance, just um, some while the beam is scanning. And so here it's, you know, it's stem, but we've lost really the sort of 2D atomic localization, but we can still probe the, the local region and do cryo eels. Um, and so some work um, showing how you can have these subtle changes in, in the, the fine structure of the edges, again, as you cross phase transitions. Um, and there's been more recently um, some very nice work that's kind of starting to, you know, build upon the dimensionality of the eels experiment, right? So you go from sort of zero dimensional eels, right? So you get the spectrum, but there's there's no tie in space to a particular atomic location. Um, and then moving up into to one dimensional eels where we now um, have a line scan that goes across, in this case, a superconducting interface, um, which is also particularly impressive because they've gone down to, to 10 Kelvin on liquid helium. Um, but again, what we are missing um, at this point is the really truly two-dimensional atomic mapping um, under these sort of in situ conditions. And so, um, you know, really where that comes from is I just showed you how you can overcome a lot of these challenges, but um, which sounds very nice, but when it comes down to eels, people who do eels, there's just this issue of time scale. And so if you think about your sort of HADF image parameters, um, you might take uh, you know, a 1K pixel um, a square image with uh, something like a one microsecond per pixel dwell time. This is still relatively fast, especially for room temperature work, um, but that gives you something like a one second um, image frame, right? And so um, if you compare that to your kind of typical EELS spectrum image, again, a two dimensional spectrum image parameters, you, you do have to sacrifice a lot on the pixels, partly uh, because of the, the experiment, but also partly just the practicality of the data. Um, but you're going to bump up your dwell time to something like 10 milliseconds. So that's a much more standard EELS SI dwell time. And so this results in, you know, several minutes uh, per single scan frame, right? And so um, what that means is that if you use those sort of analytical drift speeds that I've already shown you from these kind of side entry cryo holders, over the course of time that it takes you to do this, this kind of EELS map, you're going to drift by more than 100 unit cells, which in almost all cases is going to drift right out of your, frame, your, your sort of field of view. And so if you want to know what that looks like, having tried it, um, right, there's, I, I think that, you know, the argument for preserving a kind of two-dimensional atomic localization in this, this is a simultaneous ADF image from a, a cryogenic EELS map with these dwell times, I think is basically lost, right? So there's no more sort of spatial localization preserved um, in this EELS map. But I told you that for a high resolution stem, we do already bump those, those dwell times down even faster. And so in my own work, um, compared to room temperature down to cryo conditions, I typically drop my dwell time by at least a quarter um, going down for something like cryo stem. And so you can apply that same strategy to your EELS map. And so if you, if you actually drop this 10 milliseconds dwell time uh, down to, sorry, this would be 2.5 milliseconds dwell time, um, you're going to get 
a, an ADF image that looks something like this. Again, also under cryogenic conditions. And so, you know, that four times improvement from the 10 to the 2.5 is really starting to get us towards this um, two-dimensional um, spatially localized eels mapping, which is where we want to go. And so, um, you know, it sounds pretty straightforward. Just turn down the dwell time on your camera and, and run faster with your eels mapping. But in fact, what we've found is that once you get to these, these very fast readouts, you enter a sort of inherently signal limited regime. And so at that point, you know, the specific hardware that you're using is really going to start to matter. So for example, here's an atomic resolution map um, shown taken on our, uh, one of our primary tools at Cornell, which is a, a Titan Themis at 300 kilovolts. Um, using a Gatan quantum GIF, and then in this case, the detector is an UltraScan 1000, which is a CCD detector. And so it's a very nice sort of atomic resolution EELS map. You can see that, you know, the stronger edges map very well, and the, the weaker edges, of course, map slightly less well, but it still looks very nice, and it's, you know, it's you'd be happy if you took it. Now, if you take that same EELS map, but instead of using the CCD, um, we switch now, we have also a K2 direct electron detector at the end of our spectrometer, the same spectrometer, um, and so we can we can actually take basically the same EELS map um, now using the direct electron detector. And so you can already see that the signal to noise in these elemental maps has sort of visibly improved and we can actually quantify um, this improvement in one way. So here by taking a line cut across this atomic row, especially in the weaker edges, um, if we measure the fringe contrast, which is sort of the, the peak to trough of the part where the atoms are, um, we can see a 40% increase in this, this contrast that we're able to extract from these maps. And so, um, again, as I said, once you enter this inherently sort of signal limited regime, um, the, the efficiency and the, the low noise of your detector really, really start to, to play a big role. And that's what we can see in these maps here. The other main advantage of the direct electron detector that you actually can't see from these maps until I, I give you access to some of the, the metadata statistics is actually the amount of time that they take to acquire. And so here what you can do is you can you know, count up the number of pixels and the exposure time per pixels, and then you can measure how long it takes from the start to the end of the map. Um, and so that's sort of the total active time um, of the, the exposure. Um, but then you can take, you know, when does it start and when does it really end? And that's sort of the total time. And so the, dis the difference between the total time and the active time gives you what we call the dead time. And so this is time that's passing. Um, and if you're under cryogenic conditions, right, it's time that your sample is drifting, but time that is not contributing to any increase in signal um, and therefore increase to, you know, your signal to noise or any of that. Again, if we compare those same statistics for the direct electron detector, what you can see is that the dead time has reduced um, actually by a very significant factor from almost 30 seconds down to seven seconds. And as a, a total percentage of the map time, um, we've reduced it by about a, a factor of four. And so the dead time, the sort of average dead time per pixel, um, again, is greatly reduced in the direct detector. And so this fast readout allows us to take actually better data in less time. And so that's really um, very critical for trying to do um, this atomic resolution eels mapping. And so that's actually what we've been able to demonstrate, um, some very cool eels work, if you pardon the pun, um, which is uh, two-dimensional atomic resolution mapping um, at cryogenic conditions. And so here you can see this same interface um, with a total SI time, again, of much less than a minute, which is very fast for, for folks who know eels. And so, as I already pointed out um, at the introduction, we want to actually go beyond the atomic resolution, you know, just the elemental mapping, and we want to also start to extract chemical information. And so, we can even do that. Um, this, this data is high enough quality that, for example, again, looking at the oxygen K edge, which is a very contains a lot of rich information about the bonding in these materials, um, we can we can very easily, you know, map this this evolution from the substrate to the interface, um, and we can look at the fine structure of some of the other core loss edges as well. And so, this is very promising for starting to extend and um, some of these, both the, the elemental, but also the chemical mapping that we're really interested in um, out to two dimensions under these kind of in situ conditions. And so really, um, you know, the trick so far is just, uh, we wanna outrun this drift. And so the first thing you do is if you're trying to outrun something, you, you go faster, right? And so um, by measuring faster, we've been able to reduce the effects of these sort of large scale instabilities such as drift, um, we can, we can demonstrate this two-dimensional mapping. Um, and um, really this is enabled by sort of the fast and the low noise detector hardware that we had installed um, on that particular instrument. So, um, so that's a great, a great jump forward for us.
Now, the next thing um, that we want to do is we want to actually measure not just at room temperature and at, at cryogenic, you know, the, the temperature of our cryogen, but we actually want to measure sort of across that whole temperature range. So again, you know, if we go back to, for instance, these, these transport plots um, that I, I showed you earlier, so for instance, of a, a perovskite phase or an infinite layer phase, and these are just kind of stand-ins, you know, pick your, your favorite oxide material and, and, and plot the transport as a function of temperature, you'll get some sort of interesting trace. Right, but if we use these as an example, if you look here at 300 kV or 300 K, this is a temperature where we we usually measure. And now with a, a liquid nitrogen cryo holder, we have access to these these lower temperatures, just under 100 100 Kelvin. Um, and so here in the perovskite, you can see that now we have access to this this other phase. Um, but what we really want to do is actually we want to be able to you know sweep across this phase space and measure in this region and sort of walk the temperature down and see really what is happening at this big kink in the transport curve. How do how does this state evolution evolve? And you know if you look over at the, the infinite layer case, of course, well this this part doesn't look too exciting. But what we'd really like to do is actually be able to push those temperatures even um, you know, to much, much lower liquid helium temperatures to be able to encapsulate really the superconducting transition, right? And so when you sort of look at this class of materials in whole, what we really wanna do is be able to measure with continuously variable temperature control um, across this whole, this whole temperature range and then you know, extending above and, and everything else. Um, and so um, in addition to the, the standard liquid nitrogen holders that we use at Cornell, we also have a, a more specialized holder um, from uh, the Honey Z company, which is also side entry um, liquid nitrogen based, but the sort of um, main benefit of this holder for the, the phase diagrams that I just showed you is being able to, to sweep the temperature. And so um, using liquid nitrogen, we cool this holder down to a, a baseline temperature around 100 Kelvin. And then there are actually, we have a six pin MEMS control, which you can see here, where you can zoom in. Um, we mount our sample on a MEMS chip that looks like this. And we can control with these four leads, um, actually the, the heating coils, this is a very local heating coil here. And so what that allows us to do is to cool the sample down to a cryogenic baseline. And then we can um, dial in exactly whatever temperature we want anywhere above that. And so using this holder, we're able to access um, pretty, pretty stable STEM imaging, high resolution imaging here. You can see at just a series of temperature steps in between that liquid nitrogen and that room temperature, um, those, those endpoints. And so this really sets us up for that kind of dynamic um, in situ control that really we're very interested in um, for these types of experiments. Okay, so um, so we have now, we're starting to build the pieces. So we have this continually variable temperature control and, and reasonable drift. And so you might think that, you know, um, with the, the sort of fast detector speeds that I've already shown you, and then combined with this, this um, access to full phase space, you know, we're ready to go. Um, but if you look at, for instance, here's an example of kind of a, a very nice piece of room temperature eels work, um, very high resolution, um, you know, across this this interface, and what's actually shown is that you can map out basically the met you can quantify the metallicity of this this interface. Um, you can quantify the excess charge by tracking out a fine structure change um, in the uh, the manganese edge in this case. And so, what that allows you to do is is build up an idea of you know how the charge buildup is occurring at this interface. And so um, this is, you know, very, very nice work done under ambient conditions. Looking at that same material system, we can start to try and, you know, reproduce some of these, um, these results, but now under cryogenic conditions. And so how does, just as some materials, you know, go from an undergo a metal to insulator transition as you cool them down, the question becomes, you know, does this does this interface undergo a metal insulator transition? How does the electronic state of the interface evolve under temperature? And so we can start to build up, you know, perhaps a similar picture. Um, things at first, you know, glance look pretty similar to the room temperature, but you'll notice that if you compare, of course, the fine structure, especially here, you can see that the signal to noise is just, um, you know, it's it's not quite comparable. And and this was kind of the best that can be done at room temperature. And if you'll believe it, this is sort of the best we've been able to do so far under cryogenic conditions. And the reason for that is really just a dramatic difference in the sort of experimental setups that were used to take this data. And so um, this room temperature work was done on a neon ultrastem that we have at Cornell um, with a an in-column sort of fixed cartridge stage. So for people who are familiar with the neon instruments, the sample is actually deposited um, 
in the microscope column and then completely just decoupled from the external environment. And so what that gives you is these incredibly low drift rates. So here's that same sample position plot, right? But now you can see that the, um, the sort of mean instantaneous velocity on this in column stage is something like um, an order of magnitude uh, slower than the instantaneous velocity we have once we move to both side entry, but also especially to um, these in situ cryogenic conditions, right? And so that is really what's sort of limiting um, those those different velocities and that different in time scale is what's really limiting our measurements um, under cryogenic in situ conditions at this point. And so, um, you know, really when it comes down to it is you can outrun the drift and you can run your, your your um, experiment faster. And if you have a fast detector, of course, that helps a lot to reduce the drift. But when you do cut down the time, you're also cutting down the total signal. And so if you go back to this cryogenic yields map that I've already showed you, if if we look at, for instance, one lanthanum atom that came out you know, somewhere from this upper corner, um, if we look at a single pixel from a lanthanum atom, you get a spectrum that looks like this. Right. And so I think for people who maybe haven't done direct detection eels before, this is kind of surprising. And so you'll notice a few things. First of all, you notice these kind of quantized steps in the spectrum. And personally, I think this is so cool because that's really showing we're doing electron counting eels, um, which I think is really kind of incredible. Right. So we're really quantizing the amount of electrons that are that are coming into our spectrum. Um, but the other thing you'll notice, especially if you you take a statistical distribution of the counts in this spectrum, um, which is what this this plot shows up here, is that we're really sitting in a, a Poissonian regime. And so if you have, um, you know, if your counts are on the order of a thousand or ten thousand, then you have noise, of course, but you have a Gaussian distribution of noise. Um, here, because we're so signal limited by just how fast we have to run. Um, our experiment, we're sitting instead in a, a Poisson regime. And so um, when you're down here, you know, the sort of root N and N comparison between your noise and your signal start to be to be very comparable um, when you're when your N is on the order of, you know, four. <laughs> right. And so really what this means is now what we're up against having sort of outrun the drift of the holders by um, moving to these these fast uh, low noise detectors what we're really up against now is just the sort of statistics um, of the experiment and so um, what we want to do to you know increase the signal without increasing the time um, uh, the way that you can do that is by actually just increasing the number of electrons that you put <laughs> put through your sample right and so um, uh, so what you can do is in a stem particularly for high resolution stem the probe current um, that you're using, so the amount of electrons that you're putting through your sample at any given time, is tied to the probe size. And this relates to, is and is limited by um, several things, but in part by the, the source brightness um, of the, the electron source that you're using. So whether it's a, you know, a shot key or a, um, an X-bag or, or whatever it is, cold bag, things like that. And so, um, so for instance, just to sort of walk through this plot, you can see now as a function of probe size, um, so we wanna be down on this end with small probes, um, you can also, you can track out the, the probe current of your stem. And of course we wanna be up on this end, we wanna have more current in a small probe um, to get more signal, but preserve our spatial resolution. And so if you sort of look historically, um, this is kind of uh, you know data from about 10 years ago on a cold fig, um, you can see that um, aberration correction has had a huge impact on being able to push this limitation. So as you go from an uncorrected um, instrument here at 100 kV, um, once you introduce aberration correction, you can start to open up that um, that C2 aperture, the, the condenser aperture, the probe forming aperture, as you move up to higher orders of correction. So here we've gone from 10 to a 40 milliradian um, probe convergence and so that already really allows you to increase the the number of electrons that you're putting through your sample while at the same time actually decreasing the size of your probe um, so uh, now you know most uh, the, of these really high resolution instruments are fifth order corrected and so what do you what's sort of the next step to keep pushing us to the left of this diagram um, well I'm gonna um, the next set of results I will introduce to you are um, from a, an instrument that we're um, just at the tail end of installing here at Cornell right now, which is um, the new Thermo Fisher uh, Spectra series. And so it's an XC FEG. So these um, are a very extremely high brightness source. Um, and so you can see I've highlighted the, the 200 kilovolts here in this blue, 
um, that there's a big jump in the amount of current that you can fit um, in a small probe size. And so, um, of course, you can track, you know, this is a function of voltage and, and apertures and all these other things, but really um, the kind of takeaway from this plot is that what we're moving towards with this new source is putting a lot of current in a very small probe. And so, you know, the clearest way to see that is just to, just to do it right. And so here's an image of um, strontium titanate um, with more than two nanoamps of probe current. Um, again, for people who maybe are less familiar with STEM, um, that's a lot of probe current. Uh, we typically work with things like, you know, 100 picoamps for these kind of robust materials. And anyone who works on, you know, the kind of biological specimens or, or soft matter will, of course, be um, completely blown away by, by <laughs> the idea of putting two nanoamps. Um, of current onto your sample. But um, looking at the information transfer from, from this image, we can see that we have information transfer out to 64 picometers. And so really we are packing a punch um, with the STEM probe. And so that is how we're going to, um, as I said, put more signal um, into our sample at the same amount of time. And so what that allows us to do is actually um, not just improve the signal, but we can now, uh, again, signal limit ourselves, right, and measure much, much faster. And so um, just to, um, again, give you kind of a visualization of this, you can think back to the, um, the first video that I showed you um, on the, the XFIG source. And now, um, instead of using um, 50 microseconds per pixel or half a microsecond per pixel, um, I'm now using 50 nanoseconds per pixel. And so with a factor of 10 increase um, in the speed, you can see in a single frame that we still have um, very good signal to noise. And of course, can register that into um, a very nice atomic resolution STEM image. And so um, for eels, what does that set us up to do? So we can start by looking at the same conditions that um, I showed you for the, the previous cryogenic eels map. So 2.5 milliseconds per pixel, um, which is about 400 frames per second um, of the, the detector. Um, but frames here is now referring just to a single spectrum, not to like one eels frame, but running at 2.5 milliseconds per pixel. But now going from um, the results I showed you before, increasing our probe current by a factor of about four, up to 450 picoamps, you can see that um, in this case, we have very um, high signal to noise, very nice atomic resolution, um, EELS maps of the scandium and the terbium um, in this case. And we can, um, of course, using this, this high probe current, we can bump this even faster. And so we can drop that by a factor of five. Um, we're not running at 0.5 milliseconds per pixel or 2000 frames per second, um, and still preserving very nice atomic resolution information, again, in both maps. And if you want to um, you know, really, really push the limits, we've now dropped the, uh, the readout speed by um, more than a factor of 10 from the cryogenic maps that I showed you earlier. And so we're running at 0.2 milliseconds per pixel. This is a maximum frame rate of the, the continuum GIF and um, CMOS with scintillator detector that we have on this instrument. And so with that sort of uh, much big increase in the, the maximum frame rate down to 6,000 frames per second, um, we can do this very, very rapid um, elemental mapping the total time for this map is about seven seconds. Um, so now we're starting to approach, right, the time scale of the hat of image, the, the frame time of one second. And so, you know, you might say that while these maps look a bit noisy, the atoms aren't quite as clear as they were on the previous maps. And, um, you know, while that's true, again, what we want to do is go beyond just identifying atomic positions. We are really interested in starting to extract very detailed information from these sites. And so, you know, if you want to get a really clear um, picture of what's going on, you can do some unit cell averaging. And so here, um, you know, I've, I've unit cell averaged across this field of view, and you can see that the atomic structure pops out very, very clearly. And what's exciting is because the frame time for this map was so fast, the, the deformation um, across this sort of single scan is actually very, very small. And so um, what that means is that, you know, a unit cell from this corner looks the same as a unit cell down from this corner, right? There's no um, big sort of shear deformation or anything. And so um, we can actually see that very clearly in the, the reciprocal space information where we've preserved now, um, when you compare the, the FFT of the terbium map to the scandium map, um, you can actually look back at the atomic model of the material in this case, and you can see exactly that in the, the terbium map, you have these super lattice peaks here, 
which relate to this sort of left-right, left-right ordering um, of the terbium atoms in the unit cell. So again, you can see that in the model, you can see it in the ADF image, and you can in fact even see it um, in the terbium eels map, and again, preserved spatially um, or in reciprocal space um, in the FFT. If you look at scandium, you can see that we actually don't have those peaks, and that's because the scandium sublattice is um, doesn't have those left-right distortions, and so in this case, there's no scandium superlattice. And so, being able to um, you know tie back these kinds of uh, reciprocal space sort of lattice symmetry information back to the um, the sort of local chemical information that we can extract from eels uniting those two things in a single measurement um, is going to be to be very very powerful for us and so um, to kind of convince you that that really fast 6,000 frames per second speed is really necessary here you know we can look back to the five milliseconds per pixel of course that looks like a very nice high high signal to noise map um, and you compare to the the a very fast map. And so again, looking at the terbium, you might you might say that you prefer this one. But if you look at the FFTs, I will tell you that for the kind of, you know, sort of materials physics that we're after, I prefer this bottom one down here because of how um, how well we've preserved this, this super lattice structure, um, which you can see again in the reciprocal space information. And so that is going to really allow us to apply some of the um, the detailed correlative techniques that we're used to using on, you know, sort of hat of stem images or ADF stem images, stem images, and actually apply those same techniques back onto our sort of chemical maps, um, which is where we we get this really cool unification um, of techniques. And so, you know, the last thing to mention is I, I keep going on about how we want to do chemical information, and so of course, for that, what you need to have is is not just a nice looking map, but also a nice looking spectrum and a nice looking single spectrum, right? Again, once you sum over, you know, 10,000 or 2,000 spectra, everything starts to look pretty nice. Um, but the real test is when you look at a single pixel, single spectrum, can you still tell what's going on in your eel's edge? And so here I'm showing you a comparison between um, the, the spectra from our, um, our Titan instrument um, again, with with about a fifth of the the probe current, and so you can see um, that by um, even by dropping our our per pixel dwell time to uh, less than a tenth of what we were using before, because we have this huge increase um, in the in the the probe current, um, we can really preserve that kind of fine structure um, signal to noise that we're interested in for these kinds of measurements. So, um, you know, we really united a lot of these kind of technical um, breakthroughs. And so by using this very fast um, GIF and camera combination, we can now increase our sort of maximum frame rate um, by more than 10 times where we were sort of previously capping out. Um, and by combining that with a very high probe current um, electron source, we can really um, also increase the signal at the same time at these very short readouts. And so that puts us in a very good spot to be able to start doing these um, very high resolution and detailed kind of in situ measurements. And so you know, if we look back over the course of how EELS has kind of progressed over the past decade and a little bit, um, you know, I think a big, a big breakthrough for the, the community, is, as I discussed a few slides ago, was really the introduction of the introduction of aberration correction and being able to, um, to really move towards atomic resolution, um, EELS and EELS mapping and with with high signal and those other things. And so, you know, using those kind of advances, you can move towards these really quantitative um, and analytical measurements, um, especially of these, these atomic scale uh, structures like an interface or, or what have you, um, that really allow you to, um, to really probe the physics of these materials. And more recently, we're starting to extend these techniques and we want to really push these into new phases. So we want to not just explore um, how these materials behave at room temperature, but we really want to explore their full phase diagram and see how, how these states actually evolve and change um, across different stimuli, right? And so where we're going now is, is you know, this EELS map that I showed you on the introduction slide, which is we want to not only understand how these phases change at the atomic scale and, you know, of a very localized region, but we want to do all of those in situ measurements. We want all of this in situ power and all of this um, analytical quantitative power, but we want to now extend it not just from, you know, the, the few unit cell scale, but we want to preserve that spatial resolution across these much larger mesoscopic length scales to start to be able to, um, to observe 
um, in certain cases, you know, how, how do these states evolve with each other? How are they interacting in real space in the sample? And how does that interaction change as a function of, of temperature or strain or other sort of stimulus? And so that, of course, all looks very promising. Um, and I think it is really promising. And so we're really excited about um, you know, where where the instruments have us poised and the, the, the experiments that we have um, up and running, hopefully, you know, any day now. So I think, you know, this is, it's really promising. Um, we're very excited to move forward. But I just want to, you know, briefly mention that, as I said, we want to unite all of these things, this in situ control, this, you know, this very fast scan and these sort of mesoscopic length scales. And that's going to give us sort of the gold star um, experiment, right? Like this is our big goal is we want to combine all of these things to be able to really explore the physics of these materials in new ways. And what's interesting is that, you know, if you just go back and you look at the stage plot that I showed you, the whole point of the talk and, you know, a lot of all of these efforts to push faster and push faster really come down to overcoming some of the sort of limitations of of the hardware that we have access to at this point. And so, you know, you can say, well, all cryogenic sample stages are going to have this problem, but we actually know that's not true, right? And so if you, again, go consult with the, the biologists or the folks who do cryo-EM, we can track their cryo stages and see that they're, you know, again, almost an order of magnitude more stable than, than the liquid nitrogen stages. Um, that were involved in all of the work that I showed you in this instrument. Of course, the drawback to these is that typically, you know, they might not be compatible with all of the pole piece geometries of the instruments, the specific microscopes that we want to use um, for these kind of high resolution spectroscopy. And also that um, in this case, for instance, this stage has only one tilt axis. And for these crystal materials, we really do need the double tilt capabilities of these holders. And so really, um, you know, just as the sort of gold star experiment is some some combination of all of these pieces that we've put together, I think one thing that, you know, we'd really um, like to see as kind of a field, everybody come together, you know, the companies, the academics, everyone, all of the researchers is to kind of push for some gold star um, average of these two things, right? We want all of the flexibility and the control that we have with these, these double tilt side entry stages, but we wanna push for the stability that exists with these, um, these dedicated or in-column cryo stages. And so that's really gonna allow us to, you know, really expand the reach of these experiments um, and, and make them, you know, much more accessible to a lot more types of material systems um, and more types of problems. So um, with that, I just wanna, um, of course, uh, thank you all for listening. Um, I wanna, uh, definitely extend a big thank you to Gatan, um, Liam, and Ray, and Paolo, and everyone else. Um, it's really fun to, to get to share some of the work, and you know, we we work um, closely um, on a lot of these products. So it's it's cool to see to see them really functioning at their their peak performance. Um, of course, I have to also thank the the folks who keep our our microscopes and all of the different parts of them up and running. Um, as best they can at Cornell, um, all of the people who contributed the samples and who collaborate with us on the, the materials questions, and then the, the full microscopy group out at Cornell, especially um, uh, David Muller and, and my own advisor, Lena Kirkutis. So um, with that, I think um, just to kind of remind people, you can submit questions um, using the, the inquiry panel um, that, that Liam mentioned earlier. And um, so while people are submitting questions, I'm going to just drop a, a little shameless plug. So if you were at all impressed or interested uh, by, by the results that you saw today and some of the instruments we have at Cornell, I do want to point out that everything I showed you today was done on an instrument, which is um, accessible through the, the Paradigm user facility. So you can go to paradigm.org and, and learn more about how you can submit a proposal. Um, to get free access to to this user facility. So, for instance, um, you know our cryo eels or the the very fast um, GIF camera um, eel setup. So, um, with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions that anyone might have. Great. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks, Barrett. That was a super awesome talk. Uh, for me, it was pretty exciting to see like some of the work that you're doing. Like, because I actually kind of looked at functional oxides uh like back in the day when i was doing my phd mm -hmm. and like kind of the kind of the phase transitions and the temperatures you're looking at were like kind of really like inaccessible kind of when i was doing my uh study so it's really it's kind of exciting to see that you can you can kind of access these temperature ranges high energy edges and really kind of do all this like super high speed acquisition yeah so yeah so we've got a 
bunch of questions, so I'll try and group them. Uh, so you talked about how imaging techniques are able to register and average frames to improve signal to noise ratio when you do really fast acquisitions in cryo. Is mm -hmm. that something uh, we're also able to do with eels or is it just an imaging kind of thing? Yeah, so that's actually something that we have tried um, with eels and there are groups who have had success in particular, I know like Lewis Jones, um, over in the UK, it does a bit of sort of non-rigid averaging, and so you can kind of, you know, try and unshear your your eels images and then stack them back together. Um, the risk of that is, you know, you you never want to accidentally unshear something that really was supposed to be there, and that's really present in the material. And so we've tried to do some rigid registration um, with our our setup here, but you know, it's again, it's just this difference of scale. And so even though we're moving to what counts as very fast in sort of the eels world, um, you know, we're running at 200 micro seconds per pixel. When I do cryo stem, I use you know a thousand times less than that or something, right? And so um, so the time scales are just too different. And so we're really, you know, yeah, someday it would be really awesome to do eels at a quarter microsecond per pixel. But I think, you know, at this point, we're really focused on these kind of um, get it all in one go measurements. But but again, if you with the, the unit cell averaging, as long as you sort of have reasonable um, sort of lack of shearing across a single frame, you can also go back and you can start to register, you know, within a single a single pass as well. So we're, we're moving towards it, but I think it's not quite there yet. OK. Yeah, that kind of leads to kind of another, I guess it's a similar question to do with the unit cell averaging. So I was curious how you would, if you're looking at um, like layered materials, how you'd account for interfaces or if you have like defects and things. So I guess you just have to constrain where you would do your unit cell averaging. Is that what is that kind of the limitation? No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you have to. And so that's, you know, kind of the risk of these these averaging methods is that you really have to know sort of a lot about the material and the, the specific region that you're looking at before you start doing these things or you risk sort of losing, um, you know, the, the exact information that you're after. And so the example that I showed is just, um, you know, this, it's it's uh, we know that the unit, the material is uniform across this field of view. But once you start trying to move towards these kind of interacting states and things mm. like that, of course, much, much harder, which is, again, why we're, we're really interested in, you know, if we can just slow down the drift a little bit, right, then we can start to, to just get it all at once or, or be able to move towards these, these averaging type techniques over cool. large fields. Could you, um, I'm going to stick on that, can you, if you wanted to average, say, along the interface and like with a mm -hmm. narrow, could you just do like a very thin averaging uh, kind of parallel to the interface and say, okay, I, I, we take this this type yeah, direction is constant. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you have, again, if as you mentioned, if you have this kind of layered material or these interface materials, you know, this, this cryo map over here, you could absolutely like, you know, basically squish that in the, the X dimension and then you end up with, you know, a line profile of your spectrum. And we do that um, and, you know, some of the other work. So the, the liquid helium that I work, it was a line profile, but of course, if you just sum up a bunch of line profiles and you, you know, you're basically registering in one dimension. And so, um, so yeah, so those line profiles are really, really useful for, for certain kinds of interfaces and, and layered heterostructures, for sure. Nice. Okay, so another question. So how important are the different hardware components? So would you say it's important to have a good detector, a good source, or is it kind of some um, somewhere in, in between? Yeah, I think, you know, I think really, Part of the thing that's that I have learned working on all these different instruments and things is it really comes down to the sort of setup as a whole, right? And so the instrument is actually in some sense greater than the sum of its parts. And so, you know, you can put the world's best detector on, <laughs> you know, like a some, you know, uh, microscope that you dug out of the basement from, you know, 1955. And it's probably not going to look as good as if you, you know, slap whatever photo diode you have laying around on like the, you know, state of the art something, 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 right? And so really what you want to have is some kind of set of components that work well together. And so for us, you know, we really, um, the direct detector on our instrument was like a huge, has been a huge boon for us. We've gotten so much information out of that. And now um, with this new high brightness source, we're really interested to see, um, you know, starting to explore the performance and, and really happy so far with the performance of our new um, mm -hmm. not direct, but still CMOS detector. And so, so those kinds of things. So I think it's really how the sort of whole instrument comes together um, as a whole is, is what really is important. Mm 
Yeah, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Then I guess uh, another one that kind of instrumentation related or kind of sample related, a question came up about damage. So it's kind of like, what do you need to consider? I think it's uh, specifically like, so what do we need to kind of consider or account for regarding damage um, specifically, I guess, for your complex oxide samples and then kind of what kind of additional considerations might you have to make using these like super, super high probe currents when you're doing uh, fast, fast math. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, you know, for when you start turning your probe current up to two nanoamps or something like that, I will say there are not a lot of materials that are robust under that beam. So even the, you know, sort of commercial substrates that we, we try and use for, for benchmarking, after a while, they start to look a little worse for wear, right? And so, um, so yeah, you can't just crank up the probe current on whatever it is you're studying and, and hope to get away with it. So um, these kind of oxide materials are, again, relatively robust. And so for certain ones, you can get up to, you know, several hundred picoamps and still be fine. Um, in these exotic phases, sometimes we have found in other systems that actually things like charge order or, you know, ferro electricity, of course, or things like that actually um, can can be suppressed under the beam. And so in those cases, you know, turning up your probe current won't help you. Um, and so again, that's where we want to also at the same time be kind of, you know, slowing things down so that we don't have to rely on these really, really high probe currents. Um, for now, it's it's kind of the, the card that we have to play. <laughs> so we'll play it whenever we can. Um, but then there's, you know, it's not just so straightforward as dose as well. There's also things to consider like dose rate and also the sort of area. And so even with the very high probe currents, as long as you can run really fast, you know, some materials are more sensitive to the total dose and some more to the dose rate. And so, for instance, if you can run very, very fast with a high probe current, that might be okay in certain cases. And as well, you can start to explore options like um, custom scans or some of the sort of like aloof or leapfrog yields techniques that um, that other groups do particularly, you know, you see it a lot right now in sort of the low loss eels community um, in the the, um, the, the you know, biological materials as well. But, you know, we can start to think about doing things like that for some of these other materials um, as well. Okay, that's cool. I, that, I had a second question about kind of dose rate versus total dose, but you're, you answered, you did both in both in one. <laughs> Perfect. You're like psychic. Uh, okay, so I think we've probably got time for one, one more. So uh, pick one more. So, okay, so do you really need the kind of very high resolution and structural position, oh, precision when you do <laughs> eels across larger length scales? So why not use the stem images to extract high resolution structure? and the EELS to survey electronic states across um, the regions. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think really um, that's kind of how we do it now, but I think there's always this question of if you have to sort of correlate back um, some kind of electronic, like average electronic measurement back to, you know, then this kind of area you think had this sort of structure going on, you know, there's always, there's always these questions about, well, did that signal come exactly from that area and, and how sure are you? And did we accidentally average over something that we, we didn't want to see, right? And so what we really want to do is we want to be able to tell directly, you know, how does some fine structure change? Like, for instance, did these sort of, you know, does one set of atoms and one sort of set of symmetry look different than if the symmetry changes somewhere else? Um, and so, so then it becomes really important to try and do these measurements. You know, what happens exactly at, for instance, a twin boundary between if you, you know, had some sort of orientation of the crystal like this, and you can think about having like a neighboring orientation, you know, twinned at 90 degrees or something, what happens at the boundary between those two materials? And so there you need to sort of, you know, be able to directly extract from the sort of uh, chemical map that you have, where does that boundary exist um, and, and where does that symmetry change? And so I think, you know, of course, there's all sorts of ways to do them together uh, or, in t it, you know, to kind of complement the two. And that's, you know, how there's been so much success with both of these techniques thus far. But what we really want to try and do is really bring them together to be able to access, you know, new physics with a new level of detail. And so for that, I think, you know, what we really do want is very high resolution um, across the, the kind of length scales that are involved um, that we typically think of for, for the imaging techniques. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so I think um, 
we're about at time. So just to let anyone know, like the other qu the questions that we've um, not answered thus far, uh, we'll address offline. So we'll reach out to you uh, over email and kind of take any of the other, you know, answer any of the other questions. So, uh, okay, yeah. So with that, I'd like to thank Barrett again for a great talk. And yeah, the webinar recording is going to be posted to our website. And thanks everyone for signing up and attending the webinar. So thanks, thanks to all. <laughs> thanks to Barrett. So great. Thanks, Liam. Thanks.